I'm Mark Halperin. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to House Speaker Paul Ryan, I want to put this to rest once and for all. Let me be clear. I do not want, nor will I accept the nomination for our party. Count me out. Let me say again, I am not going to be our party's nominee. I should not be considered, period, end of story. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> Happy Just Say No Day, sports fans. On the show tonight, lots of stuff, including my conversation with Ice Cube about politics and race and all kinds of other matters. But first, the biggest news in the presidential race today came from someone who was not in the 2016 presidential race and now insists emphatically, dramatically, he never will be. House Speaker Paul Ryan held a surprise press conference on Capitol Hill to address the rampant speculation that he might possibly, maybe, just maybe, be a potential white knight riding to the rescue should the Republican convention in Cleveland this summer be terminally disastrously deadlocked. Ryan's resounding message today, not, not gonna happen. happen. I want to put this to rest once and for all. As you know, I have stayed out of this race and I have remained neutral. As chairman of the Republican convention, my job is to ensure that there is integrity in the process, that the rules are followed by the rule book. That means it is not my job to tell delegates what they should do. But I've got a message to relay today. We have too much work to do in the House to allow this speculation to swirl or to have my motivations questioned. So let me be clear. I do not want, nor will I accept the nomination for our party. So let me speak directly to the delegates on this. If no candidate has a majority on the first ballot, I believe that you should only choose from a person who has actually participated in the primary. Count me out. I simply believe that if you want to be the nominee for our party, to be the president, you should actually run for it. I chose not to do this. Therefore, I should not be considered, period, end of story. All right, so we're going to be covering uh, this Ryan story from a lot of different angles tonight, maybe every angle. We're going to start with the biggest question. Mark, does this truly, really, actually close the door on Sir Paul Ryan and his trusty white steed? It closes it a lot, but not completely. You know, Team Ryan was very frustrated that uh, people like us, including us, speculated that he would be the premium white knight. And yeah. if you think about other possibilities, I still believe that if the convention's deadlocked and if the three guys currently running, none of them can get a majority, any which way, that Ryan still makes more sense. I happen to know he'll be at the convention. Um, <laughs> but this makes it a lot harder because, because he has now said as a principled matter, it should be someone who's run in this race. The three guys running are other people who entered. I think it makes it much, 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 much less likely that he would be turned to, but I don't think it ends it because he still makes logical sense to unify the party. I think it comes pretty close to closing the door fully for just this one reason, not because I have any great faith in Paul Ryan or like that he wouldn't change his mind. But th in the end, the, the task of the white knight, if he is nominated as a white knight, is to somehow get those Trump voters, those disaffected Trump voters to come back and vote for him or her in the fall election, right? To, to, they will be mad to begin with, but now they will be angry and not only see this person as illegitimate, that white knight, but would see him as being a total hypocrite who lied to the country and then capitulated or whatever ended up going around their back. I think it would make that, that he's put him, he's set itself up now so that it, it makes it almost impossible for him to do what he would need to do as the nominee. And of course, it also has always been harder because he's presiding over the convention and he's close to the chairman of the party, so it would look even worse. So probably it's over. All right, Ryan's no, therefore, can be seen as a sobering reality check for Republicans who don't like the three current options. Many of them have most likely already started fantasizing after Ryan's afternoon press conference about who else the white knight could be, or at least maybe an off-white knight. Here is our mosaic of potential Republicans. It's more speculative than repertorial. It's a result of crowdsourcing aggregation and our own conjecture. You'll recognize a lot of those faces up there. John, where does Ryan's decision to shut the door leave the White Knight Dreamers in search of somebody 
to be there if the three current candidates deadlock? Uh, I believe the phrase is grasping at straws. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, esteemed Republicans and military people up here on this wall. Um, none of them, none of them uh, are really plausible in, in any really kind of serious way. The, you need, ideally, you'd have somebody who'd run for national office before. And the people up there who run for national office, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Dick Cheney, those people are not going to be the white knight. So I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of options up you there. You see the knights realistic. of no. I see the knights who say no. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. I mean, Ryan made so much sense. Somebody like Mitch Daniels, maybe. The problem is, again, Trump will have minimum third ballot. I'd say minimum, even if he collapses, 500 delegates. Yeah. And you're going to need those 500 delegates to be happy and the people they represent. So it's got to be somebody who is aligned with Trump on a lot of issues. And frankly, most people of stature in the Republican Party. Are not. They're not. They're are for, not. They're, they're even for close. Free, they're for free trade. Many of them are for a different kind of policy on immigration. And foreign policy and a whole, and a whole variety of different yeah. things. It's a totally different tone and temperament yeah. to, uh, to politics. I, I, again, I just came back to experience, though. You've got to have all these. None of these guys have been vetted at a national level, except the, for the ones who the are like fact, the former president. I know we're over time, but I was going to say, the fact of Ryan's decision and the symbolism means a lot of Republicans are going to give up dreaming about a white knight, and they're going to say, Kasich, Cruz, Trump, pick them. Best, pick news, one of best them. news in the world today for Ted Cruz and, and John Kasich. Yeah. Uh, all right, now for what we're calling Ryan's rule, kind of what I alluded to a second ago. That's Ryan's argument that at least when it comes to conventions, only candidates who are or were in the race should be considered for the Republican nomination. So, Mark, the question I have for you, yeah. again, leading back from directly yeah. to our previous topic, will Ryan's rule prevail now? I think for a lot of people it will, but that that would be an attitudinal thing. Mathematically, if it's not Trump on the first ballot, Trump on the second ballot, right. Cruz on the second ballot or Cruz on the third ballot, then you're in a deadlock situation. And I'm amazed at how little speculation there is about a Trump-Cruz ticket. Even though they've been, obviously, animosity between Donald Trump and the man he calls Lion Ted, the Politics. easiest way to break the deadlock, Politics. easiest way to break the deadlock is to say, Cut that's the ticket. And, that, and I think increasingly, unless John Kasich can, can really move up, and we'll talk later today about an important speech he gave today, unless he can really move up, the simplest thing, unless Cruz or, or Trump prevail in the first three ballots, is to just team up. And that means it is going to just be people who are in play. The symbolism of what happened just makes it very hard. For, if Ryan won't do it, Ryan won't bless it, very hard for anybody else to come in. Uh, I think there's a, you know, the, 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 <laughs> right, I agree with everything you just said. I just, you know, I think that the, the reality is Donald Trump's either going to get to 1237, or I think there's going to be a mad dash to cut a deal. And the deals could go a variety of ways. Cruz could try to cut a deal with Kasich to put him over the top if no one's at 1237. Trump could try to cut a deal with either one of those two guys. Kasich might have enough delegates yeah. to put Trump over the top. And you know, we just heard Trump, yeah. you know, talking about potentially putting yeah. Kasich on the ticket. The other, the other thing to keep in mind about Ryan's notion of someone else who ran but isn't still in the race. Sometimes people run. And, and, and leave the race with glory, like Joe Biden. No one's done that. No one did that. No one. You know, uh, no one in this party. You know, pe uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, governor of Wisconsin. Scott Walker. Scott Walker left after 70 days. Yeah. Jeb Bush, disaster. Mark Rubio, disaster. Rick Perry, disaster. None of them left yeah. on an upswing. It's yeah. these three guys. And the only one who sort of actually might have qualified is Chris Christie, who's an endorser now of Donald Trump, That's which right. wouldn't really work. Yep. Yeah. Finally, after all this, Paul Ryan still, of course, now will ch serve as chairman of the Republican Party convention in Cleveland this summer. And he still has, as he talked about today, his big plans for presenting a vision to the country and from his perch as Speaker of the House from now until Election Day, no matter who the Republicans nominate. So, John, can Paul Ryan effectively play those two roles, as he said today he wishes to do? Key word in there was effectively. He can play those roles. I think he'll try to play those roles. But... I don't think he'll very effectively play them because what we know about presidential politics is that presidential politics is going to blot out the sun. The legislative branch is going to go into abeyance, and that's going to include Paul Ryan. The only way I think he can do it, and this is something Paul Ryan is capable of, if he is super specific about a set of policies and the nominee is not, the problem is once he's super specific, he's going to have to tilt one way or the other, left or right or center. Right. And I think, and I think it's going to. If he was super specific, it would only serve to divide the party and probably give the Democrats a big opening. Well, that's what I mean. He could he could be it if he wanted to be a shadow party running in opposition yeah. to Donald Trump as nominee. Maybe we might end up there, but that's the only way, and that's not effective. That's effective in a certain sense. Not 
effective in terms of setting the, cor the course of the Republican yeah. Party. That's serving as like a loyal internal opposition within the opposition. Yeah, what's he going to yeah. going to propose comprehensive immigration reform? Is he going to propose entitlement reform? All the things budget cuts directly against the, the against the platform of the nominee. Yeah, <laughs> problem. All right, here and, we go. And not politically popular. Uh, when we come back, two roads diverge in the wood. And sorry he could not travel both and be one traveler. Long he stood and gave one of the best speeches of his campaign. What John Kasich said today in Manhattan about the path less traveled in this Republican primary, right after this. But enough about Paul Ryan. Now it's time to talk about some presidential candidates who actually want to be presidential candidates. Today, Ohio Governor John Kasich gave one of the most important and most presidential speeches of his campaign so far. To a packed room in Midtown Gotham City this morning, Kasich painted an optimistic vision for the country and he lambasted the negativity and fear that he says has infiltrated American politics. He never once, though, said the names Trump or Cruz. When we come together, when we unite as a country, America always wins. For those who are angry or afraid, I want to assure there is another better way to deal with this. Some who feed off of the fears and the anger that is felt by some of us and exploit it feed their own insatiable desires for fame or attention. That could drive America down into a ditch and not make us great again. The path that exploits anger, encourages resentment, turns fear into hatred, and divides people. This path solves nothing. It demeans our history, it weakens our country, and it cheapens each one of us. It has but one beneficiary, and that is to the politician who speaks of it. The other path is the one America has been down before. Fear turns to hope because we remember to take strength from one another. Uncertainty turns to peace because we reclaim our faith in the American ideals that have carried us upward before. And America's supposed decline becomes its finest hour because we come together to say no to those who would prey on our human weakness and instead choose leadership that serves, helping us look up, not down. John, did Governor Kasich accomplish what he set out to do with that speech today? Uh, I'm going to let you talk about some of the stylistic and what the room was like. You were there, I was not. Um, I've seen the video of it and I've read it on paper. I thought, you know, if what he was trying to do was to draw a very clear, bright line in the sand between what he and many Republicans see as a, a kind of Republicanism embodied by both Cruz and Trump that is not the kind of Republicanism that Reagan embodied and that what the party has tried to in its best moments embody for the past 20 or 30 years in American life, I think he did a pretty darn good job of marking a very clear line and putting himself on the other side. This was a very good speech because he spoke from the heart and he, and he made the distinction clear. And it wasn't just about electability. It was no. about a vision of the country. I will say, ironically, Paul Ryan, as you said earlier, Paul Ryan's decision is great for Kasich. Ironically, it overshadows him. Yeah. If, if, if Ryan had made this decision yesterday right. and Kasich had done his speech today, or even vice versa, but the same day means it's not going to get very much coverage on most shows. The other thing I'll say about it is, if he'd given this speech the day after he won the yes. Ohio primary, yes. he, I, the, the, today yes. was a good day to give it, yes. but he got stepped on, and I, I'm not sure. And the other thing I'd be curious to see is, does he keep it up? In the room, yeah. people loved it. Right. It was his crowd, though. Yeah. Can he keep this up? Can he keep that message going? Because that message has, will have tens of millions of people in the party interested in I guess the guy's made me crazy now for weeks because for weeks he's been hinting at such a speech coming right in a time and place of my choosing I kept I mean again just for the sake of there, there were many opportune moments when he could have given that speech you mentioned one the day after he won Ohio there have been many others this one by sheer bad luck turned out not to be the great moment but if he sticks with it if he sticks with it it could be an important thing for his convention strategy and getting the only thing I was missing was talking specifically about Trump and Cruz and I think I'll eventually have to do that without as he says taking the low road right totally all right Donald Trump speaking of in some cases the low road Donald Trump was at it again last night at his rally in Albany the Republican frontrunner repeated his new favorite talking point that the nomination process he's competing in is rigged unfair corrupt so crooked it has to screw on its own pants wait there's another way to describe it 
It's a fix. Because we thought we were having an election, and a number of months ago, they decided to do it by, you know what, right? Right? They, saw, they said, we'll do it by delegate. They said they're going to do it by delegate. Oh, isn't that nice? If I go to the voters of Colorado, we win Colorado. So it's a crooked, crooked system. You know, we think about democracy, and we think about our country. Let me tell you a little secret as far as our country is concerned. We have a democracy, but we've got to keep our democracy, and we're going to do that. So, Mark, uh, the big division on this, on this question, is this a really good politically effective argument that he's making here, or is this just, as Ted Cruz puts it, whining and not going to fall on deaf ears like most process arguments do with voters? If he makes it about himself, like when he says, the RNC is not treating me well, if he says, I'm being ripped off, I think it, 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 it could be seen as whining. If he makes it about the voters, look, the system is undemocratic. The system is complicated, and, and, it, and, it is, and it is intended to reward inside game rather than popular appeal. So I think he's absolutely right. I think it will rally his supporters, and I think it sets him and Paul Manafort up, if they don't like the way things are going at the convention, to start challenging things in a way where I think he'll have a lot of PR mojo behind him. Part of the question, though, for me about this, I think that for those who are already in the Trump camp, who are inclined to believe the system is rigged. It's part of why, like, why, they, why they like Trump to begin with. I think this will get them more angry and more upset, and it will lay down the predicate. I don't know that it expands his voter pool at all. I don't know that there are doesn't undecided need to. There are voters. Well, he does need not, to, right? Not to win the nomination. Well, to get up to 60% of the delegates, he's going to need to do better. He can't just get 35% in these coming states. I don't know that he is. I well, think if he, uh, that's most the, the places, most of the places there's polling, he's on track. Does he want more voters, or does he just want to keep a static pool? He wants more voters. He wants to win the right? nomination. But he wants more voters. More voters would help him win the nomination. I'm just saying, I think it definitely riles up his people. I don't know that it expands his appeal. He's speaking from the heart, and he's got a lot of the facts on his side. Up next, we'll talk Democratic politics and more with Bloomberg senior White House reporter Margaret Taleb and Howard Wilson, senior advisor to Michael Bloomberg, and a former communications director for Hillary Clinton, also a former deputy mayor of Gotham City. Margaret and Howard with us right after this. Ooh, Wilson. Sometimes when you're total amateurs, you just have to call in the pros. So joining us now is Howard Wolfson, <laughs> senior advisor to our boss, Michael Bloomberg. He's also the former deputy mayor of New York City and the former communications director for Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign. And in Washington, D.C., the great Margaret Taleb, Bloomberg's senior White House reporter. Um, Howard, only because you're here, I'm going to start with you here and just ask you this question. What, what, what do you make at this moment of where we currently stand in the Democratic race, having some experience with long, bitter nomination fights? Uh, people are tired and people are getting bitter and tensions are beginning to manifest themselves in the day to day back and forth. Uh, I think at the end of the day, Hillary Clinton will be the nominee. She will not need superdelegates to become the nominee. And we all know that in this process, it is very difficult for the person in second place to catch up once they fall behind. We have no winner-take-all states on the Democratic side. Uh, but the campaign will likely go forward. Bernie Sanders is going to win more states. Uh, he's going to collect more money, and I assume he will go all the way to California. And uh, hopefully, at some point, the two sides begin to ratchet down. In 08, there was a point at which we had come to some conclusion that we were unlikely to overtake Barack Obama, and both sides began to kind of ratchet things down at that point so that, you know, you could come together at the convention. I assume something like that will happen, but it's clearly not happening yet. Yeah, no. Margaret, since the Wisconsin primary results came in and Sanders won big, what are things the Sanders campaign has done well? I mean, Sanders' campaign has done a couple things well. One is continue to inspire his supporters with the notion that, math aside, a comeback is still possible and he can still overtake her. If Wisconsin could happen, uh, you know, perhaps New York can happen or come close. If that could come close, perhaps California is the place where the magic happens. And it is this promise of something that's sort of beyond the bounds of statistical probability that is very much... Uh, kept him alive. But what Secretary Clinton is doing much better in New York this week is tailoring a New York specific campaign, and you're just seeing much less of that sort of differentiation and localization on Senator Sanders' part. 
I'm not uh, criticizing this, but I'm asking you to unpack it because you're familiar with, with these things. Uh, what good does it do Hillary Clinton's campaign for her press secretary to go on Twitter and kind of engage in <laughs> attacks and negativity towards the Sanders campaign? What, what is that? What is purpose does that serve? Um, you know, I didn't see it, so I don't know exactly what you're referring to. But well, I, just the general. I won't say I won't say juvenile, but the you know kind of caustic, sarcastic back and forth using social media. Yeah, I, I guess I would attribute that to. A general fraying of the nerves. Uh, but this, does it serve a purpose? It, it, you know, it serves as an outlet <laughs> for people's frustrations. Right. Uh, I'm not sure it necessarily serves an electoral purpose. Although it seemed pretty clear to me that one of the messages that the Clinton campaign was trying to drive this week in New York was that she was tough enough right. to take on Donald Trump and that she was tough enough to handle tough questions and difficult questions. And so maybe a little bit of uh, punch ball on social media may drive that a little bit. So one of the interesting things about this race on the Democratic side is that it's a, it's a mirror image of 2008 in which Hillary Clinton is now Barack Obama. <laughs> and Barack Obama is now, or, or Hillary Clinton is Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton was Barack Obama. So here's my question for you, Margaret. Just I want to do a psychological question about, about <laughs> where was Barack Obama's head at this point in 2008? And how did his aides deal with getting him to not be excessively uh, self-destructively annoyed at Hillary Clinton sticking around long after the math made it impossible for her to win. The primary difference was that he was the underdog even when he had was clearly on a path to, to glide past her and she has never been the underdog in this race. There was a point at which she right up well until the end depending on how you count the states where he didn't compete where she led in the popular vote uh, and then was finally surpassed in the delegate vote. She is running ahead in both right now. So it's a different psychological game but it's true in both cases that the aides and the advisors uh, had to keep reminding these candidates to pace themselves and not to act too presumptive in a way that could uh, catch up to them or embarrass them later. Right. So, Howard, my question to you, you dealt with Hillary Clinton a lot in 2008 in these circumstances. What You talked a second ago about how there came a point in which you decided as a campaign not to do things to make things worse with the Obama campaign. Talk about her and how you got to the point where she accepted that in that race. It's tough because um, when you're winning, as uh, then Senator Clinton was late in the spring, early in the summer. And as Senator Sanders is, is now. today. The, the temptation is to think on some level, uh, you, you ask a psychological question, that this is possible. People are voting for me. I go it's to... The Charlie Sheen School of Politics. Exactly right. Winning. No, and, <laughs> well, you, and, and in, in then Senator Clinton's case, she would go to these rallies where there were enormous numbers of people showing her a great deal of love and affection. And it was hard to sort of square that reaction that she was getting in her bubble with the delegate math, which is brutal and cold and doesn't show a lot of love or hate. It just is what it is. And so at some point, though, and I give her a lot of credit. She was she's a lifelong Democrat. She understood that in 2008, at some point, the party needed to come together, get a nominee who could win against the Republicans. Pause right there, because I'm going to actually come right back to this when we come back after we have a hard break right now. Margaret Howard, just don't go anywhere. We'll keep this conversation going after these quick words from our sponsors. Back talking about the Democratic nomination fight here in New York. Bloomberg senior White House reporter Margaret Taleb in Washington with us here in the studio. Howard Wilson, a senior advisor to our boss, Michael <laughs> Bloomberg. Margaret, uh, the, the president and the vice president both have talked about Hillary Clinton this week. Uh, the vice president yesterday talked about Sanders and Clinton. I'm just wondering how anxious you think they are and the White House operation is to get this nomination fight settled so they can play a role in helping whoever the nominee is. I think they'd certainly like it to be settled. I think they both largely think it is settled. Uh, you'd see more agita and more angst otherwise. Uh, they both have made a commitment uh, not to jump in at this point, that this is for the, the party, uh, uh, for voters in the party to decide. Uh, but they both slipped quite a few times. President Obama has, to my mind, been almost doing this for a year now. And uh, Vice President uh, Biden almost did it yesterday in this uh, interview that was released with Mike. So, um, uh, but I think in both cases, you're seeing a situation where they don't want to be part of a division. They want to be part of unifying the party. And so they're waiting for this to resolve itself before they can jump in. You've got a situation where Hillary Clinton, the public polling suggests is up by maybe a dozen points. 
in New she, York. In New York. She's had some stumbles this week, but I think it's safe to say that she's had at least as good a week as Sanders since Wisconsin and probably better. If you're Hillary Clinton's camp, are you worried at all now that somehow because of his big crowds, the debate, something could lead him to win the primary or is it done? I mean, debates do uh, can change things, uh, and it is conceivable that he has an amazing debate and she has a terrible debate. She doesn't have a history of having many terrible debates. In fact, she's a really good debater. But you know, he's a good debater too. But could the polls be wrong? Could those big crowds spook you if you're in the Clinton camp? Uh, you know, you have to be concerned. But all of the polling that I've seen, and I gather the campaigns have seen, and that we've all seen, suggests that she will get somewhere in the mid 50s in the state. Do, do you think just on the basis of what you know from 08, where knitting the party back together was a challenge sure. after after the 08 race, do you think it's going to be a harder or an easier task this time around? Because I sense among a lot of the Sanders people at least as much intensity as you sensed among the Pumas back in 08. Yeah, it's funny. A month ago, I would have said it would have been easier because th that race in 08 was pretty difficult at certain points. Yeah. It now feels like it may be just as complicated. Uh, and that it will take some work on behalf of everybody to knit the thing back together. Is that exacerbated at all by her surrogates being pretty aggressive with Bernie Sanders and questioning his bona fides on some issues? Does that make it harder? I mean, look, you do have to continue to draw some contrast. The, the, this is going to go on until June, and it's only April. So you can't take your foot off the gas just yet. But at some point, I think you're going to have to kind of ease off the gas a little bit and recognize that, look, Sanders is going to win some states. He's not going to win enough of them by enough of a margin to be the nominee. And the important thing is to have a unified party going into the fall. Yeah, it seems to me that one of the great complexities here for Hillary Clinton is she's going to be dealing with someone on the other side who is not like what Hillary Clinton was to Barack Obama the last time around, which is to say a loyal Democrat, a loyal Democrat. That's right. Someone who's been a big challenge for her. Yeah. Margaret, if, if you look at uh, Bernie Sanders and, and sort of uh, get a read on where he stands, do you think he thinks he still can be the nominee or is this now about accumulating delegates and influence for Philadelphia? It's certainly about trying to influence the conventions, but sure, if you're a candidate and you're still in the race, you have to believe there's a way you could do it. There are a number of outstanding issues, there are a number of outstanding states, and there is, of course, the FBI uh, investigation that continues to hang over uh, Secretary Clinton and her aides. But uh, I think Bernie Sanders and his aides are smart people, and they can understand the math as well as anyone sitting here talking about it. I, he's trying to do both, and you see him still competing very aggressively and talking very aggressively now. Certainly, this could change by California, depending on what happens in New York, what happens in that mid-Atlantic corridor, and what happens as we move west. Do you get the sense that the president would relish Donald Trump being the Republican nominee, both because he likes, seems to like to talk about him and also because he thinks it would be relatively easy to beat him? Um, unless it isn't. <laughs> yeah, sure, the entire Democratic establishment would relish it unless they were wrong and unless he put her in a corner and he won, then they'd all blame themselves for not doing more to stop it. So it's a risk, and I think everyone fr on the Clinton, in the Clinton camp and in, in the Democratic Party understands that. If you're running Hillary Clinton's campaign, who do you want to run against uh, as the eventual nominee, Donald Trump or Ted Cruz? Donald Trump. You do. Because? Uh, because um, given his negatives, he's not electable and he will... Uh, put states in play that would otherwise not be. And the fact that he's as unpredictable as he is wouldn't give you pause. Cruz seems to be a largely more predictable and yeah. conventional candidate. Um, so there might be some uh, more difficult days emotionally because of Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump's presence in the race. But uh, I cannot imagine circumstances under which somebody with his numbers currently and his style of campaigning best could case get for elected. Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump how many states could she win best case uh, I think best case uh, Obama 08 map is the floor not the ceiling I understand but how many states could she win uh, I think I think in addition to the states Obama won in 08 you put Arizona in play you put Utah in play uh, you put maybe Georgia in play and but, I th but fewer than five additional states yeah, but not, but not McGovern. No, not McGovern. We don't live in that country anymore. So no, not McGovern. But uh, but the states that were maybe 51, 52 Obama become 55, become safe, and you can really extend the map out. Plus, you have enormous possibility of taking the Senate back and winning substantial gains in the House. It'll be up to like 350 yep. electoral votes. All right, Margaret Howard, thank you both. Up next, what George W. Bush told our next guest about fatherhood. And if you're watching us in Washington D.C., you can listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 91, 99.1 FM, and we'll be right back.
help of former presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, both of whom he covered, our next guest was able to connect with his son Tyler and learn more about the unique challenges that come with raising a child with Asperger's. He recently wrote about the experience in his new book, Love That Boy, What Two Presidents, Eight Road Trips, and My Son Taught Me About a Parents' Expectations. Joining us now is a political columnist for the National Journal and author Ron Fournier. Ron, thank you for coming thank on you the show. Thank you for having me. This is great. There's often uh, one asks, it's a very hackneyed question to ask of an author, but uh, <laughs> is to ask about the title of the book. But in this case, there's a great story behind the title of the book. Yeah. That's important, so tell it. In 2005, I was leaving the White House beat to cover uh, Bush's re-election campaign, sorry, 2003, to cover his re-election campaign. And as you guys know, there's a long history, a kind of tradition where when you leave the beat, the president brings in the family and thanks the family on behalf of the correspondent for all their sacrifices. It's been going on for many decades. So Bush was doing it for me, and then I walk with my three kids and my wife, including Tyler, my son, who then was five. This is quite a bit before he was diagnosed with autism. And Tyler comes in and all he can talk about is Barney the dog. You remember Bush's dog? And he's going on and on and on with that deep baritone voice and you know, machine gun delivery. And then he starts talking about Fala, Roosevelt's dog, and telling the president more about Roosevelt's dog than I think Franklin Roosevelt knew about his dog, which is typical for these kids. And I'm very anxious. I'm kind of worried that I'm you know, taking too much of the president's time and my son's kind of maybe embarrassing himself, maybe even me. And Bush, I think, could sense it. You guys know how well he reads a room. And uh, as, as they were leaving uh, the, the office, the president kind of grabs me and takes my hand and looks me right in the eyes, almost like a presidential directive, and says, love that boy. And at the time, I kind of took it to be, that's kind of a nice thing to say. And he's right, I should love my boy, despite the fact that he's quirky and, and a little bit different. And through the course of doing the book, nine years later, I realized, no, you got to love your kids, and i got to love this boy because of what makes him different. What makes him different makes him special. What did, you, what did you learn from watching your son interact with President Clinton, who you've known for a long time? Yeah, you know, that was interesting because it was on the penthouse suite of his library, and we started that meeting by Clinton and I looking out over Little Rock, and we're doing the old, you know, the old hometown sites and reminiscing on our career together, and he sits down with Tyler, and I kind of fade in the background, and they're talking about Teddy Roosevelt, which is Bill Clinton's favorite president and is Tyler's favorite president. And Bill Clinton, you guys have heard this, when Clinton talks about Roosevelt, you know, the parallel between our times and Roosevelt's time and his presidency and Roosevelt's presidency. And I'm taking notes. It's really fascinating, really smart. And I notice that Tyler is kind of Clinton's lost Tyler. And I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, Bill Clinton now has been obsessed for 45 minutes on one topic, which is very much like my son. Um, and he's not picking up on the social clues. And I actually wrote down in my notebook is Bill Clinton and Aspie. Now, I know Bill Clinton is not autistic, but the point is if the, the guy who's probably the greatest communicator I'll ever cover and literally, you know, could feel a nation's pain, if he's not, um, if he's got some social rough edges, why am I so worried about my sons? It's, it's interesting that, 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 that in these, you know, that you're interacting with obviously guys you covered and had a professional relationship with, yeah. but you really took away some, like, Real insights about your son from your relation, from your interactions with presidents. I mean, yeah. just as you reflect now back on it, what what do you feel like you what was revealed to you in some ways about about Tyler that you didn't know before those interactions? One, then he's probably the guttiest person I'll ever meet. I mean, it's awfully hard sitting down with the president if you don't do it for a living. Um, for Tyler, it's awfully hard for him to sit down and talk to anybody. It, it, what we're doing right now does not. It's not just uncomfortable for him. It's unnatural. Um, and uh, like with Clinton, we were watching a news conference just before the meeting, and Tyler turned to me and said, uh, you do this, Dad, I don't want to do this. And I said, but your mom wants you to do this. I think you need to give it a shot. And he walked in and did it. So I learned how gutty he is. I learned not to sweat the rough edges, and I learned um, to love him because of his idiosyncrasies, not despite them. Just to set this up a little bit more, you, you and I met when you were in Little Rock. You were based yeah. there for the Associated Press covering Bill Clinton and then came to Washington when he came to Washington uh, to cover the White House and, yeah. and then, as you said, covered the Bush White House. In, in all that time, you put a lot of time into your career. Yeah. Uh, covering the White House is a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of work. So talk about the importance of, in the process of thinking about the book and writing the book, of thinking about transitioning maybe a little bit from that hard focus on a demanding job to dealing not just with your son but with your whole family. Yeah, it really came to a head the day he was diagnosed. We walked out of the doctor's office and my, my wife Lori, literally, as we're standing in the parking lot, tearing up, just heard the scary word that I knew very little about, autism, and Asperger's syndrome, which I knew nothing about. Um, she said, it's time to step up. You need to get out and spend some serious time with him. You've got to 
bond with them. And specifically, you're taking them to presidential sites because that was Tyler's fixation, his obsession, which is an autism type word. Right. And she said, literally, uh, you know, the presidency is what took you away from the family. You're going to use it now to help them. Um, so off we went on these guilt trips. Um, Ron, we could talk to you for a lot longer. Um, the book deserves an even longer uh, session. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, up congratulations. next. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank, yeah, congratulations. Up next, we have Ice Cube <laughs> talking about Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and Black Lives Matter. You will not want to miss that. One of this year's inductees to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and undoubtedly the most deserving, is NWA. Last Friday, on the day of the induction, I met up with one of the group's founders, and now a certified movie star, Ice Cube. Let's just say it, it was a good day. What well, we talked about his music, his new movie, Barbershop, the next cut, which opens this week, and last year's celebrated hit film about the group straight out of Compton. We also spent a lot of our conversation talking about politics, starting with the ways in which NWA was from the start a defiantly political act. We said you're about to witness the strength of street knowledge, meaning you are about to witness, you know, uh, a knowledge coming off the streets or out the streets that you may not have ever witnessed before. We just wanted to be real. We just wanted to be honest. Street knowledge is a term to me. It means letting the streets know what the government, politics, police, whatever, authority figures are are doing up to uh, exposing them and also letting, who, if the politicians are listening, letting them know what the streets think and how things are going and hopefully there's some understanding that can be made in all this. You became like a flashpoint in a lot yes. of ways. Um, what was that like to experience that? And I mean, when you look back on it now, does it seem totally crazy to you that like you guys were at the center of so much controversy? Yeah, it was weird. And we didn't think the world cared what was going on in Compton. But to speak on it and to do music and to get all this recognition, it was, it was great. But also, we had to realize and grow up real fast because we felt the powers that be were kind of converging on us, you know, at the time. And it became a, a freedom of speech issue. You know, the PMRC, you know, led by Tipper Gore, and, you know, you had C. Dolores Tucker and, you know, countless other people coming out the woodworks really trying to say that, you know, music was the cause of all evil in the world. And, um, we knew that wasn't true. Right, so, the, so the movie comes out last year, right? Um, Straight out of Compton. And it comes out at this moment when you got Ferguson, Baltimore, Staten Island, all these incidents of you know, uh, police brutality. And it was like a lot of the stuff that you guys were talking about in 1988, 1989 was suddenly like super relevant again to mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff that was going on, right? In a lot of ways, it's a shame that the same thing we were going through is the same thing that's still happening and and not too much has changed with the behavior of the authorities on you know just realizing that that you know it's not cool to prey on your own citizens it's just never cool but you know one of the things that was going on in the summer like i said last summer when the when straight out coffee came out was the beginning of this black lives matter movement you know one race in the culture is being treated you know, pretty unfairly, and it's probably more than one. It's, it's probably a few that are, are being treated pretty unfairly by the system. So that has to be addressed. Uh, and I think the fact that you even have to say Black Lives Matter lets you know how bad the problem is. People who don't understand the Black Lives Matter movement need to understand. When you feel that the government is against you, who's going to be with you? Uh, Bill Clinton was giving a speech down in uh, Philadelphia and had a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters came in and tried to shout him down. And they're upset. They, they remember back in the 90s when Hillary Clinton, running for president now, uh, re talked about uh, gang members as super predators mm -hmm. and was, had used that kind of rhetoric to, uh, to justify the notion of a lot of the tough crime policies that her husband and the Congress and all those people passed. Mm -hmm. You know, super predator, that's like the kind of stuff people used to say about the guys in NWA, right? And the, mm -hmm. and the culture that you yeah. guys represented. It seems crazy that we're still having this conversation in 2016. To call 
your own citizens super predators uh, is pretty harsh and you know and it's, it's pretty big indictment you know it's just like the term thug or or hootlum you know it's just an easy brush to paint somebody with and it's and it's really um, not solving the problem it's just making it worse uh, because now you have you know, the people or the authorities feel like, okay, now they're justified at how they treat these so-called super predators. And what is that? Who is that? I mean, specifically, who are you talking about? Because, um, you know, the thing back in the 80s, Daryl Gates uh, and the LAPD, they did a war on gangs. Right, sure. But if I'm a black kid that's not in a gang and I have a but I look like a gang member to this white officer, then it's a war on me. So that's the problem with a term like super predators. Right. And for some reason, the Democrats feel like they're exempt from <laughs> these protests. It's like, we're Democrats. Why are you talking to us like this? Go talk to the Republicans. No, no. Everybody's a little guilty yeah. of putting, you know, of uh, turning their back or, you know, or passing bad legislation and everybody should be called out on it. That like still makes sense to you that that conversation still happened, like the Black Lives Matter wants to prosecute that case. That makes seems like still yeah. totally legitimate. Of course, yeah. of course, because she might be the president of the United States, you know, and if she becomes the president of the United States, we need to know what she's thinking, how does she think, how is she gonna handle this, how is she gonna fix this? You know, she helped create it in a way. How are you gonna fix this? You got a point of view about Donald Trump? Uh, well, you know, Donald Trump is what Americans love. Donald Trump is what Americans aspire to be. Rich, powerful, do what you want to do, say what you want to say, be how you want to be. That's kind of been like the, the, the American dream. So he looks like a boss to everybody, and Americans love to have a boss. So. You know, that's his appeal to me. You know, do I think he's going to do anything to help poor people or people that's struggling? No, because, you know, he's a rich white guy. How does he, how can he relate? You know, and he's always been rich. And, you know, being rich don't make you bad. I ain't saying that, but I'm just saying, how can he relate? Right. How can he relate right. to, the, to, the, to the small guy? For a lot of people, like when Trump even before he ran for president, four years ago, when he was like one of the leaders of the birther movement mm -hmm. and was loudly going around saying that President Obama was not legitimate president yeah. and that he was born in Kenya. For a lot of people, that's like, that man's a racist. Do you mm -hmm. feel like that? I, I still, I mean, I, I'm still mad he took down the USFL. <laughs> 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 I think that was a cool league, right. especially for the summer. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, nah, man, you know, it's like, he sounded crazy to me then, yeah. you know. Uh, I could see raising the question, but once you get the answer, man, move on. You know, to to still harp on it and to lie that you're sending investigators and all this stuff to me was was just uh, a guy who couldn't who couldn't say that he was wrong. Right. And and what do you think about? Uh, you got any thoughts about Bernie Sanders? You feeling the burn at all? Uh, guy talking about the 1%. I mean, you know, they, for a political to revolution. me, it's like he's been in there 30 years and, you know, what have you done? What have you done? You've been there. You've been up in there. So what are you going to do different from a whole, you know, from outside Congress? Now, you you know, what's, what's, what's going to happen different? Where you been? I, I, you know, so all of them to me got, got work to do to get my vote. Thanks. Our thanks to Ice Cube. And we'll keep you updated on the Cube primary. <laughs> we'll be right back. There's lots more. Wait, 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 more. wait, 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 wait. Yesterday I wasn't here, right? I heard you guys had some birds in this place. Oh, we had birds. Can you get the birds? Brought the birds. Can you get the birds back? Get the birds. Bring them in. Oh, there oh, they there are. There they are. Okay. Get out awesome. of the way. Get the birds back. Lousy <laughs> bird. Lots more on BloombergPolitics.com right now, including great reporting by our man in the house, Billy House, on Paul Ryan and how his fans in the Republican establishment 
are taking the news today that Ryan won. Coming, Ryan won't run. Coming up on Bloomberg TV, Emily Chang speaks to legendary venture investor Peter Thiel. Until tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel. Thanks for watching. Sayonara.